stories of all time were, were the vaccines, particularly for smallpox. And if you want to read a story, it's called The Speckled Monster. It's an amazing story. It was all done voluntarily, but people came in by the droves. George Washington wouldn't let his wife visit until she got vaccinated. So I'm all for vaccines, but I'm also for freedom. I'm also a little concerned about how they're bunched up. My kids had all of their vaccines, and even if the science doesn't say bunching them up's a problem, I ought to have the right to spread my vaccines out a little bit at the very least. All right, thank hey, you so much. Coming up, Jake. I'm hey, sorry, I, Governor Huckabee, please. I think we need to remember that there are maybe some controversies about autism, but there's no controversy about the things that are really driving the medical costs in this country. And I would really believe that the next president ought to declare a war on cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's, because those are the four things that are causing the greatest level of cost. John Kennedy said, we'll go to the moon in a decade and bring a man back, and we did it. I grew up in the 50s. I remember the polio vaccine. We saved billions of dollars since that time because we haven't had to treat for polio. Why doesn't this country focus on cures rather than treatment? Why don't we put a definitive focus scientifically on finding the cure for cancer, for heart disease, for diabetes, and for Alzheimer's, a disease alone that will Thank cost you, us $1.1 trillion by the year 2050. Thank you, Governor. We change the economy and the country. We have to take another quick break. Coming up, Ronald Reagan looming large over this debate. So how Reagan-esque exactly are these Republicans? We will find out next. Welcome back to CNN's Republican presidential debate at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. We have a few last questions for you, two of them a little lighthearted, uh, the other one more serious. We'll start with one of the more light questions. Senator Paul, I'm going to start with you, and we're just going to go down the line. Earlier this year, the Treasury Department announced that a woman will appear on the $10 bill. What woman would you like to see on the $10 bill? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um... You know, I'm big on uh, that we were, and I love what Carly said about women's suffrage. I think uh, Susan B. Anthony might be a good choice. Governor Huckabee. That's an easy one. I'd put my wife on there. <laughs> I've been married to her 41 years. She's fought cancer and lived through it. She's raised three kids, five great grandkids, and she's put up with me. Nice, I mean, who else could possibly be on that money? other than my wife, and then that way she could spend her own money in her face. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Paul? No. Senator Rubio? I'm mean? sorry, Senator Rubio? I'm sorry. I know we all look alike, right? <laughs> Just the senators. The uh, Rosa Parks. <laughs> An everyday American that changed the course of history. Senator Cruz. Well, I wouldn't change the $10 bill. I'd change the 20 I'd take Jackson off, and I'd leave Alexander Hamilton right where he is as one of our founding fathers. Uh, and I very much agree with Marco that it should be Rosa Parks. She was a principled pioneer that helped change this country, helped remedy racial injustice, and, and that would be an honor that would be entirely appropriate. Dr. Carson. I'd put my mother on there. You know, she was uh, one of 24 children, got married at age 13, had only a third grade education, had to raise two sons by herself, refused to be a victim, wouldn't let us be victims, and has been an inspiration for many people. Mr. Trump. Well, because she's been sitting for three hours, I think my daughter Ivanka, who's right here. <laughs> Other than that, we'll go with Rosa Parks. I like that. Governor Bush. I would go with uh, Ronald Reagan's partner, Margaret Thatcher. It's probably illegal, but what the heck? <laughs> Since it's not going to happen. A strong leader is what we need in the White House, and she certainly was a strong leader that restored the United Kingdom to greatness. Governor Walker. First of all, i got to say to Carson Huckabee, thanks a lot for making the rest yeah. of us look like yeah. chumps up here. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'd put Clara Barton. I once worked for the American Red Cross. She was a great founder of the Red Cross. Ms. Fiorina. I wouldn't change the $10 bill or the $20 bill. I think, honestly, it's a gesture. I don't think it helps to change our history. What I would think is that we ought to recognize that women are not a special interest group. Women are the majority of this nation. We are half the potential of this nation, and this nation will be better off when every woman has the opportunity to live the life she chooses. Governor Kasich. Well, it's probably not uh, maybe legal, but uh, I would pick Mother Teresa, the lady that I had a chance to meet, a woman who lived a life so much bigger than her own, 
an inspiration to everyone when we think about our responsibility to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Governor Christie. Uh, I think the Adams family has been shorted in the currency business. Uh, our country wouldn't be here without John Adams, and he would not have been able to do it without Abigail Adams, so I put Abigail Adams on the bill. All right. Some good entries, if anybody at the Mint was listening. Here's the next lighthearted question. You all know that the United States Secret Service uses code names for the president and his family. Ronald Reagan's code name, for example, was Rawhide, an homage to his performances in Westerns. Nancy Reagan's was Rainbow. You don't have to come up with the one for your spouse, but what would you want, Governor Christie, I'll start with you, your Secret Service code name to be? <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been called a lot of names by a lot of different people. Now I've got to get called by names by the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say True Heart. Well, I have one now. It was my detail. They called me Unit One. My wife says, you'll never be Unit One. I'm Unit One. You're <laughs> Unit Two. <laughs> Secretariat. Governor Walker. Harley. I love riding Harleys. Ever ready. It's very high energy, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Trump. Humble. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Dr. Carson. One nation. Senator Cruz. You know, as a Cuban, I might go with Cohiba. And, and I'll tell you, I'd go with, for Heidi, Angel, because she is my angel. Senator Rubio. Well, there's some people in Florida upset at me over a joke I made about Florida State, but what the heck, I want my code name to be Gator. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Arkady. I'd go with Duck Hunter. Senator Paul. Justice never sleeps. <laughs> That's a mouthful, but okay. <laughs> okay, here's the more serious question. Ronald Reagan, the 40th president, used the plane behind you to accomplish a great many things. Perhaps most notably, to challenge Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down the wall, and then ultimately to make peace with the USSR. How will the world look different once your Air Force One is parked in the hangar of your presidential library. Senator Paul. I mean, I met Ronald Reagan as a teenager, and my family were big supporters of him when he ran against Gerald Ford. It was a big deal because he was the grassroots running against the establishment. And I'll never forget that, and how we stood up and said, you know what, this is something new that our, that our country needs and that our party needs. If I were president, I would uh, try to be one who says, you know what, I'm a Reagan conservative. I'm someone who believes in peace through strength, and I would try to lead the country in that way, knowing that our goal is peace, and that war is the last resort, not the first resort, and that when we go to war, we go to war in a constitutional way, which means that we have to vote on it, that war is initiated by Congress, not by the president, and that we go to war reluctantly, but then when we go to war, we don't fight with one arm tied behind our back, we fight all out to win, but then we come home. At the end of my presidency, I would like to believe that the world would be a safe place and there wouldn't be the threats, not only to the U.S., but to Israel and our allies, because we would have the most incredible, well-trained, well-equipped, well-prepared military in the history of mankind. And they would know that a commander in chief would never send them to a mission without all the resources necessary. But people wouldn't bully us anymore because they would know that that would be an invitation to their destruction. Domestically, We'd be operating under a tax system that eliminated the IRS. People wouldn't be punished for their work and for what they produced. And life would be really deemed precious. Abortion would be no more. It would be as much of a scourge in our past as slavery is. And we'd have a peaceful country where people respected each other and people respected law enforcement. And we would focus on cures. And we would make this country not only safe from our enemies without that's safe from the enemies within. And it would be a good place to raise our kids and our grandkids. One of the things that made Ronald Reagan a great president is that he understood that America was a unique nation, unlike any other that had existed throughout human history. He knew it was founded on universal principles that were powerful, 
the dignity of all people, human rights, the rights of all to live in freedom and liberty and to choose their own path in life. He just didn't believe it. He acted on it. That's why bringing down communism was so important to him. If I'm honored with the opportunity to be president, I hope that our Air Force One will fly to the, first and foremost to our allies in Israel, in South Korea, in Japan. They know we stand with them, that America can be counted on. It would also fly to China, not just to meet with our enemies, not just to meet with those adversaries of ours that are there, but also to meet with those that aspire to freedom and liberty within China. I would even invite them to our inauguration. We would also fly into Moscow and into Russia, and not just meet with the leaders of Russia, but also meet with those who aspire to freedom and liberty in, in Russia. And ultimately, I hope that my Air Force One, if I, belong, if I become president, will one day land in a free Cuba, where its people can choose their leaders and its own destiny. Ronald Reagan believed in America. If I'm elected president, our friends and allies across the globe will know that we stand with them. The bust of Winston Churchill will be back in the Oval Office, and the American Embassy in Israel will be in Jerusalem. Enemies across this world will know the United States is not to be trifled with. ISIS will be defeated. We will have a president willing to utter the words radical Islamic terrorism, and the Ayatollah Khamenei will understand that he will never, ever, ever acquire nuclear weapons. Here at home, we'll reignite the promise of America. Young people coming out of school with student loans up to their eyeballs will find, instead of no jobs, two, three, four, five job opportunities. How will that happen? Through tax reform, we'll pass a simple flat tax and abolish the IRS. And through regulatory reform, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. You want to know what I'll do as president? It's real simple. We'll kill the terrorists, we'll repeal Obamacare, and we will defend the Constitution, every single word of it. Well, you know, I was a radical Democrat before I started listening to Ronald Reagan. And he didn't sound like what they said Republicans were. He sounded logical. And I hope that I sound logical also. Because when I look at what's going on with the United States of America, I see a lot of things that are not logical. I see us allowing people to divide us when, in fact, our strength is in our unity. I see people exercising the most irresponsible fiscal habits that anyone could possibly do and hiding it from the American people so that the majority of people have no idea what our financial situation is. So when someone comes along and says, free college, free phones, free this and that and the other, they say, wow, that's nice, having no idea that they're destabilizing our position. And I think also that Ronald Reagan was a master at understanding that a pinnacle nation has to be a nation that leads. If we learn to lead in the Middle East right now, a coalition will form behind us, but they will never do it if we just sit there and talk about it. Real leadership is what I would hopefully, hopefully bring to America. If I become president, we will do something really special. We will make this country greater than ever before. We'll have more jobs. We'll have more of everything. We were discussing disease. We were discussing all sorts of things tonight, many of which will just be words. It'll just pass on. I don't want to say politicians all talk, no action. But a lot of what we talked about is words, and it'll be forgotten very quickly. If I'm president, many of the things that we discussed tonight will not be forgotten. We'll find solutions. And the world will respect us. They will respect us like never before, and it'll be actually a friendlier world. And I have to say, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Good. Six million more people are living in poverty than the day that Barack Obama got elected president. Six million more people. The middle class has had declining income. Works, workforce participation rates are lower than they were in 1977. For the first time in modern history, more businesses are failing that are being created. That is what the next president will have to deal with. And I believe we can reverse course by creating a strategy of high sustained economic growth. Not the new normal of 2% that all the left says we just have to get used to, but a 4% growth strategy where we reform how we tax, 
fix the broken regulatory system, embrace the energy revolution, 